Welcome in everyone to the finals. It is season one's top eight semis and finals officially here for the Snap Judgments League. For those who do not know, my name is Guest, also known as It's Guest Gaming, and we're gonna be broadcasting your top eight, your semis, and the ultimate finals, wrapping up season one for the Snap Judgments League. But don't worry, season two is right around the corner, so be sure to take a look at how to join down in the description below if you are looking for the Snap Judgments League. Be a part of their Discord, be a part of the conversation, and be a part of this tournament scene. So let's talk about what we have going on right now. Our top eight are Darth Nader, JJ Rolk, Looping Moon, Thrillo, Santi Dubos, Slush Death, Goat Seeker, and Lofison. Now, we're gonna be showcasing first and foremost the top eight, the elite eight, depending on where you come from. And let's dive right into those first battles. We're gonna be taking a look first and foremost at Darth Nader versus JJ Rolk, but we're gonna be looking at it from Darth Nader's point of view. And this is one of the things that I love about this very specific type of tournament, anyone can be a part of it. You never know who's gonna make the top and you never know how they're gonna be playing. Are they on a PC? Are they streaming? Are they using a tracker? Are they, how are they doing it? Well, mobile is competitive. So let's dive on into it. Let's go take a look. Boom, right over here and swing over, start the conversation. Three, two, one. Darth Tater versus JJ Rowe. Good luck, have fun. They're diving on in right off the bat. And because they're not streaming, we actually have the ability to have the volume on. It's a very rare thing, very, very rare thing. So let's do so, why not? Looking at a She-Hulk, Professor X, Magic, Blob. Okay. Not too bad on the list. It's a little loud, the sound. We're gonna, I don't wanna blow out the entire stream's ears. I apologize, because we are streaming this live on Twitch. We do all of these broadcasts live on Twitch, and we bring that on over to YouTube. If you wanna ever see these live, come join us, twitch.tv backslash it's guest gaming. So, on this play though, as, as, I'm, as I'm looking at it, Magic Blob, Infinite, She-Hulk, I'm not 100% sure what direction with the Ravona deck they're going here. It's like Ravona Ramp, but the Infinite, maybe this is a War Machine style deck? Hmm, I don't know. How would you, if you had the opposite opening hand, how would you assess it? as Magic goes ahead and flips the Limbo. Now, as a reminder, these games are pre-recorded, but I am seeing them live for the very first time. So I do not know the end results. We're all gonna be finding out together of who is the winner of season one Snap Judgments League. Let's see as we get the lockdown potentially on Central Park, trying to get a double play. They could go for the, the Sinister London play as well, but it's a little bit riskier, especially with Pryo. I like the idea of trying to cheek out just one side, assuming that Rolk is gonna want to play over into Sinister London. If they're playing Cable, who's gotten this huge resurgence the last couple of weeks, snap. as we see a snap come in, I'm, uh, I'd be a little hesitant. I'd be a little hesitant, but with Ravona down on turn four, it, JJ isn't able to compete in that lane. He goes for the potential snipe on Limbo with Yondu now taking out. There it is, the Sunspot. All right, so a Central Park lockdown. It's now a dead tie. Millen, Millen, and they're sitting on a blob. So it's Mill versus Ravona Ramp. Hmm. Yeah, with that Ebony Maw in hand, this has got to feel like a War Machine deck. As Black Wakanda Panther forever. comes in. Hello. Hello. That's, a, that's a scary Panther there into the limbo, even when they go for the Blob She-Hulk 1-2 punch afterwards. Lots of rocks being added too, so it could be a pretty nice size double comparison here. And they go for the double float. 
hoping that there isn't going to be a Scarlet Witch or a Storm. It could be anything at this point. But I think they're honestly probably pretty safe. Take the double float, show the fear. There is a case to be made to dropping down Blob and She-Hulk on turn six rather than turn seven in this match, but I can respect it either way. I don't see why not throw down the Pixie. One power versus zero power, and it's not going to get copied over into Sinister London. Because you'd have, and they're not going for the Blob. They're going to take the security of Infinaut definitely at 20 first. Advantage definitely is to Darth Tater too, because Rolk is sitting on priority. So if Rolk's sitting on priority... With a large double lead, knowing that there was a skip 5-6 on this lane, he's got to try to figure out, can he scale over on his first card in Limbo exclusively? He doesn't have 20 power to go Victory. over the top on that. Best case scenario, maybe I could see have been an Odin, but it doesn't feel like that style of deck as Rogue backs away for two cubes as we go into round number two. Could be filling the location. Could be filling the location. Just for security, but the Pixie at 1-1 would have been one extra power. And opening hand Zandar. There's the War Machine. Okay, so Pixie War Machine is what Tater decides to bring to the top eight. Going to show you what, how wide of a meta this actually is right now in Marvel Snap. Anything can compete right now. Parker! As an Arnim Zola gets passed over from Roll. the cable hit early. That's going to be something that Tater's probably going to have to play around pretty consistently too. The understanding that if they end up with priority, Pixie into cable is a very common line for tune two, turn two. So you've got to be safe each time. Cable stealing the Ravona and it will not show for Darth Tater that it came from Darth Tater or from the pull on Cable because it is a card from the original deck. As they draw a 1-0 blob and a 1-1 Professor X. Those are some scary numbers to deal with. With War Machine in hand, I'm surprised we don't see a snap right now, but Gladiator is going to make it interesting as it pulls out a Sunspot, destroys the Sunspot in Limbo. Nothing too crazy, but Profex secures another lane super early in these magic matches. I like the play, too, oh, of just dropping the Prof X in particular, because you are sitting on War Machine. So later on, if there needed to be a reversion, you could then play it one step further and revert it so that way you can drop down the Blob or any other card into war with the War Machine into that Prof X lane, given the flexibility of the deck. Plus, a 6-8 Cannonball on the mixed-up draw is not the worst thing in the world. Got a few Wakanda feeling, forever! Oh, sh blah, blah, blah. Got Hello, to be feeling Hello. pretty good about that one. There we go. And there's our flipped over Nebula, who hit 5-1. I also find it a little surprising that we haven't seen a Mobius yet in Darth Tater's deck in these first two rounds. You would expect to see that duo for a turn two, turn three, but we'll find out.
And a Baron Zemo is going to clog Xandar on turn six by pulling out an Ebony Maw. Big hit. Big, big hit. All right, so going over the top into Xandar. Can only really be done via Cannonball and Blob. I think that's really all they need. Either way works, dropping the blob into the mid and the infinite or the cannonball, whether it moves it over or not, those lanes are done for. And Darth Tater is just sitting, soaking it up right now. Darth Tater here live with us in the chat, letting us know and keeping us filled in on what can happen, what is happening, and trying to figure out what to do because Blob doesn't make any sense. The deck outright says it's over. There is nothing left here. And the hazmat Hello. with Luke Cage drops it down to a tie in the mid and the tiebreaker is going to swing Rolk's way. Taking it down to an 11 versus 16 tiebreaker. Rolk comes in with the surprise hazmat Luke Cage combo to win four cubes of over Darth Tater in round number two. Dirty play by Rolk. And a nice surprise nevertheless. Did not forecast that coming. As we start off with a Jotunheim, now definitely favoring Rolk, who we now know has a Luke Cage sitting amidst in their deck. This is looking like Darth Sader's already taken that magic and targeting Jotunheim just in case to remove the advantages. Interesting lines, looking at Rolk's deck now retrospectively, thinking about the Zola Black Panther that's in there, as well as the Hazmat line. Thinking about something cheeky like Zola-ing the Hazmat is actually quite fun. I'm a big fan of that. Gonna have to steal this deck. But which one is more interesting to you? There's the magic taking down the Jotunheim as we expect. But if Hazmat's also going down early into White Hot Room, there's one of two things probably following up. They're either going to compete for it quickly, or they're going to Odin it later on. If there is Hazmat, I'm, excuse me, if there is an Arnim Zola and there's a Black Panther, it wouldn't surprise me to also see that be a viable option. Hmm. The big draw, Infinite in hand, and Ebony Maw in hand who's sitting at 4-7, thanks to the Pixie mix and match. As Zemo pulls the re-inverted blob, killing the deck. Absorbing Man Grandmaster even in this, and there's nothing left, so we know they are sitting on at least that Black Panther in hand. They are sitting on at least that Luke Cage in hand, and a couple of others. As Tater looks to try to lock down the white hot room on five, because even if the Black Panther drops as a 5 4, that's going to bring that lane to 10. Victory! And with two turns after that, it would have been too close, especially with them sitting on War Machine in hand. Well, interesting thing. I think I'm gonna take out of this right now is that it's not base power from Baron Zemo, and I have not seen that happen quite yet. That was a new one for me. 
I have not Zemo take an inverted card like that. So we've all learned something today. Well, at least some of us did. I know I did. But now, four rounds in, never seeing a Mobius. I, I'm, I'm shocked with De Darth Tater's deck here as Yondu goes ahead and tosses away that Ebony Maw. Huh. And we're back. It's White Hot Room again. This is a good mix and match here. Only She-Hulk, Ravona, and War Machine in hand as Pixie now does the shuffle, taking a couple of those ones, but giving the six right back to the Infinite, which always feels bad. Grandmaster brings the cable over into the mid, pulls out another card as Ravona is going to flip into the Ant Maze, add another plus three on top of it as well, trying to compete by keeping up in the white hot room. And it does, it does the Ravona Slayer slide. With no way to fill the white hot room advantage, Rolk, if he wants to take it. going for just stats to get a head start in Shuri's lab, even though that card is best optimized on the next turn for the Infinite. Absorbing Man just trying to fill up the lane, not doing really much else. And now Tater has to decide if he has enough to work with on this potential priority play. On the one end, you can Professor X go into a She-Hulk play next turn, who's going to be only th a 310. And that's the direction it looks like they're going. They split the difference as Prof X goes to two. That's 14 in the left. Gladiator pulls out out of Aunt Mays, which puts the magic onto the board, flipping over, buying another turn for Tater to keep drawing cards to keep up in the white hot room. And with Infinite and She-Hulk in hand, that's got to feel incredibly Wakanda good forever. as that Black Panther goes over the top to 16, stealing the left. So now you absolutely have to look at your option of potentially floating entirely without Sunspot down on the board to go and compete in Limbo and White Hot Room because the left is essentially a toss location. A She-Hulk to go slightly over the top means 23, maybe 25 if, if they're lucky, would be enough. Tight, nerve-wracking call between these two, trying to figure out what did Cable pull? What could Cable, you know, be interfering with this. What's the best possible pull as there's a snap that comes down? Rolk says I've got you beat in the limbo lane. 20 isn't going to be enough. Because if they drop down that 23, Limbo's going to only need to have 15 power to go over the top within two turns. Definitely attainable for Rolk. Good snap. Take the cube away. It is now seven to five, advantage JJ roll. Hmm. Tight play here for both players. Interesting matchup watching them because of that cable in particular. In my opinion, the cable's a really interesting card as you worry about the pixie pulls constantly, as you have one of the heaviest draws you could pull out of this deck, She-Hulk into the Infinite into Cannonball, really looking to kill the blob down to nothing, which is probably your worst draw. Ravona Prof X is now a reintroduced viable option. And there's
There's your cable. Ooh, and a little bit of an extra fun bonus for Lake Hellas. If that can lay still and have sewer system get removed from Los Diablos, this could be an easy lockdown location for Professor X, who's getting a little extra power on that side. Baron Zemo is going to come into the party, though, and draw the Ebony Maw, locking that location for them. But at least it's locked down with 14 power. The fun thing to also start really heavily considering is how Cannonball is going to work here, because Cannonball can move out that Ebony Maw out of Lake Hellas into a dead location if it's committed as a dead location. So part of the argument's got to be for Tater. Do I Prof X now and try to win one of these two lanes knowing that I can just lock it with Cannonball at the end? Or do we chance it by just having enough power just in case first? They go for the chance it side, not looking for the super fast lockdown, being too fearful of the hazmat being able to reduce down the Prof X line on a two to one card advantage in Los Diablo space. But Wong makes this much more dangerous. Now there's the threat of Wong, Black Panther, Zola, or Wong, Hazmat, Absorbing Man. So depending on what you think is coming, defines if you need to build anything into the middle lane whatsoever. Either way, the left lane is in a very dangerous position. The right lane's in a much better place. If it ends up being the hazmat line, it can survive it. If it's the dark, uh, the Black Panther lane, er, maybe not so much. Tough call here to figure out what to do. And Cannonball's gonna come on down to take the Black Wakanda Panther. Forever out of that lane and knock it over to the left. So now your Zola's on a 50-50 shot for win. But Tater also has priority with a Professor X in hand. So do they go for the Zola 50-50 or the security of trying to go over the top with, let's say, Hazmat? because Hazmat Luke Cage would be enough of a power swing. Actually, I stand corrected, it would not, because Nebula's gonna go up to 19. We also know that something to be weary of is the Absorbing Man by itself. Absorbing Man onto the ruins it would take on the Black Panther lane and go exactly like Black Panther. 4 to 8 to 16, so that's a lot of power to also deal with with the mid. With She-Hulk and Cannonball also on the board, Blob is going to be pretty low. And they're going for it. They're going to lock down. They hoped it was Zola. It was not Zola. Into the ruins. They flip over the Doctor Doom, Doom adding another five, making its first appearance, putting five, ten with the two Doom bots. And it's enough to steal Lake Hellas away for four more cubes for JJ Roak. Ooh, sneaky. Sneaky Dr. Doom to steal in the right. All right, Tater. We've seen crazier comebacks. It's seven to one. Tater's got to win four in a row. Do you think that he can do it? Let me know in the live chat.
Kiln with Strange Academy is a, a Kiln Vault Strange Academy. What a mix of locations to work with here. And I really like this call. I really like removing the movement off of this. Ooh, War Machine's a big hit for Gladiator with two locked out locations in a seven turn match. By going for the proc, proc, profex in the left, you're essentially forfeiting the kiln. If you drop the nebula in there now, with three floating turns, it would only get up to one seven. If nothing else was played into the kill. Hmm. Try to lock down the vault, which would reopen on seven, and they do. They secure it as they go way over the top with the kiln, who pulls out the sunspot, which helps to thin for Blob. Ebony Maw now sitting as a dead card means that they're gonna have to drop Blob at this point to prevent any further draws. Sitting on a nebula, sitting on a She-Hulk, you need to absorb but maybe the cannonball, or you could risk it to try to pull the cannonball with a 50-50 shot going, sorry, a three out of four shot. Sorry, two out of three shot, that's perfect, two out of three. And Wong comes down. Wong comes down here. And we do have to now start fearing Hazmat. Hazmat with Absorbing Man would flip the vault to be negative for Darth Tater. Blob eats up everything in the deck, Infinite and Cannonball included. As Roke drops, drops down the first part, which is the loot cage. So you know it's coming. The four reductions would flip the vault to being a negative four. And it looks like Tater, who's down to his final cube, has no choice but to go for it. And Roke might be able to come back and steal two, st steal the win. This is a scary moment. If they have the absorbing man, I believe it's over. Two cards drop. There's your She-Hulk. There's your Nebula. There's a Black Panther to try to go over forever. the top. It's not the Hazmat yet. And a Yondu only. It's not enough. Not enough. JJ drops two. Victory. The game continues. The game continues. No Hazmat drawn means Tater still lives. Bring on the next round. Breathing a sigh of relief right now, Darth Tater is trying to figure out if there is even a chance that this could happen three more times. Let's go to round number seven. Opening hand, Ravona, Ebony, and Sunspot. Sunspot's a nice feel here. And a Castle Blackstone makes it a little interesting and tempting for that Ebony, Maw, and Nebula. The good, so good upside to all this is Nebula, Ebony, Maw, into the mid would still be a pretty strong way for Castle Blackstone to run. The downside to all of this is that, well, then Pixie's now almost a dead card because you're sitting on She-Hulk and Infinite in your hand and all of your one drops are down. There's your Zemo who pulls out Pixie to ruin Rolk's plan or throw some confusion out there. Rolk just got rolled by Pixie. Woo! All right, Tater. 
Are you too taut to trot and go for it again with the Prof X? Now that Prof X actually does have some weight here. With two Castle Blackstones on the board, it's incredibly tempting to try to compete for the left. But Rolk doesn't take that bait as the Prof X comes on down and the Black Panther comes as well, who's got the Wakanda plus two from forever. Wakanda Embassy sitting now at 12 power. That looks like it's going to be a potentially lost lane. The winning lane on the Castle Blackstone now makes this next play incredibly interesting. You could War Machine to try and steal back the Wakandan Embassy, or you can double float to drop down 32 power into the mid, knowing that Sunspot's gonna shoot to nine, it's not gonna go into Shang-Chi range, Ebony's stuck at nine, Nebula's gonna stop at seven, so that's a lot of power in the left to try to recover. 32 going on three into the mid is gonna be 35. Rolk's gotta find a way to get 35 minus eight, so 27 power into two lanes. And Tater just straight up doesn't think that there's a way for Rolk to be able to do it. There's no reason for retreats for Rolk. So play it on down. Here comes the Gladiator, who's gonna pop out a cannonball to bat out that Gladiator. No one gets destroyed, but it does help the left-hand lane as the Luke Cage, who's got plus two on him, also drops. Now that left lane is competitive again. So not only did they go big with the She-Hulk and the Infinaut, they could take it even further now with the cannonball, and it's really a race for the left. Does Rolk have nine more power to compete in Castle Blackstone? And this is a huge play coming from Tater, who has opted to skip to keep the free She-Hulk as the only card down and put eight more power into the Sunspot. If this works, this is a hell of a risk, because you know Rogue's sitting there thinking after that full float, there's got to be 32 coming in. I've got to compete for nine, because no matter what, I would be restricting the nebula on the left, so that's not going to grow. If they drop it down, they're sitting on eight power, I mean, uh, eight mana, so Sunspot's going to go up two. That's a guarantee. So if you're Rolk, not thinking that Infinite's not going to come down. You only think you've got to do just a little bit. But instead, by playing your four power Wong and then the two 10 Doombots into the mid, you thought 23 was going to be enough. But by floating nine into Sunspot, Darth Vader holds on again. That's another two. Two down on the comeback, two to go. What an opening round to work with here in the top eight for season one of the Snap Judgments League as both players start round eight with a couple of one drops as Yondu's gonna get rid of the Nebula and Sunspot's gonna sit there in DC. No magic in hand, but the vault makes it interesting too. Grandmaster's gonna feed over that Yondu to also now hit the Ravona, who's a pretty big hit here as they're sitting on the Prof X. Prof X on four has been such a huge play for Darth Tater. That one destruction from Yondu may have been the end for Darth Tater in this round. As the Abbey comes down, with a war machine in hand, feeling comfortable playing down the Ebony Maw, guaranteeing the card draw no matter what out of the Abbey, there's some flexibility here. Pixie draws a flipped She-Hulk. As Zemo draws the magic to buy more time, which is going to reopen the vault on turn seven. Cannonball took the big up. 
going to 6-8. That means at highest, Infinaut sitting at the deck at a 5-20. At highest. They're opting to buy into it on this turn as Gladiator is going to come on down and destroy nothing. The Infinite gets drawn and 28 sits into DC to start. Now with only a Profex as a playable card on turn five with War Machine, is the Profex going to be able to hold down the Limbo or is Rolk scared of the Vault and need to put power in there now? We're not worried about a Shang-Chi that does not exist in either player's deck. So Infinite can sit and relax and be a big, big beefy boy doing nothing else. Depending on the drop of the vault, this could be really interesting for the final turn as we get our Profex to lock in a card as Hazmat reduces everybody down on only Tater's side of the field because Luke Cage is now locked behind Limbo. So Limbo now in a deficit. Me oh me oh my. Darth Tater going for the float, bring up the sunspot while sitting on She-Hulk and Cannonball in the deck. Nothing can get added into the vault on this turn. Rolk doesn't have the cards to put enough into DC to steal the prio of DC. They will have priority no matter what going into this next turn. It looks like it's over. And we, I, if I'm looking at this correctly, between She-Hulk and Cannonball, Cannonball is going to go into the mid on the final turn of the game with the She-Hulk over in the left. That's going to guarantee a win in the vault and 35 plus 6, 7 in total. It's going to be 42 power to compete with on the left. Doom rules all. The Doom bot makes it interesting because we may have a conversion now if they could, if they fight for the left. If Dr. Doom is dropping, we do have concerns now for the middle lane. And She-Hulk may have to be played mid. It looks like She-Hulk will probably have to get played mid because if there is an Abzman, Abzman makes more sense in the center because then the Doom bot's going to get the DC boost. There it is, Abzman comes on down, adds a Doom bot into the DC, which only adds eight power. It's not enough to steal the lane, but watch this. There's a cannonball. Boom, disappears, drops it on down, and three games down, one game to go. Darth Taters come all the way back to a 1-1 one, one cube tie, nine rounds deep. What an opening round for the Elite Eight. Here we go. JJ Rolk versus Darth Tater. GG's. What an amazing comeback. Can Tater pull it off? <laughs> All right. The comeback on the line. Yondu does its first destruction. Ravona down on two has always got to feel good in this deck, especially if we end up with a draw. Hopefully, with a Profex. Profex at any point now with the Superflow existing is something to be scared of. And if I'm Rolk, I heavily debate about playing into the Superflow on this turn because it was an eligible turn for Professor X to lock down a lane at the sacrifice of his own mana. Yandu's gonna get copied by Absorbing Man to destroy the Sunspot, getting rid of the little tiny, little tiny dinky pieces, but we do have seven turns to work with. No Profex yet, but you do have big cards. There's no Profex so you could look at blobbing on five. Oh, excuse me, this is turn four with five mana. 
it would be absorbing the Profex for one, the Ebony Maw for seven, so that's eight power, and the Pixie. So that'd be a five nine blob. And taking a light 5-9 blob is probably the best play, in my own personal opinion. But I'm not in the finals. They are. And there's a reason they are. With all four cards, big, beefy, and ready to play, there's your 5-9 blob as Luke Cage comes down to give a little bit of boost to the sewer system. Tater's down to his last four cards. Taking the float on five. What's the best line for these four cards with these three rounds? They're going for the float on five for six mana. That's going to make She-Hulk and Infinite eligible to be played simultaneously. This looks like they're going for a big cannonball victory on the turn seven. Unfortunately, Tater had Yondu destroy their sunspot. Otherwise, all of this float would feel even better. But Rogue's gonna drop down the Wong into Superflow, semi looking at a potential. Hello! Hello! A potential Prof X, but it didn't happen. So now. Being fearful, because remember, they do have Black Panther Zola. So Black Panther Zola would be putting out 32, up to 64 power Black Panthers, depending on the ordering drop. Infinite into She-Hulk here. If they do Black Panther into the Superflow, that gives priority to Tater, who would be able to cannonball prior to. Yep, there it goes. There, prior to Wakanda this looks like forever. Tater might be able to do it. Hello. There's Can the Infinite and the She-Hulk. Priority switches back over to Darth Tater, who's now going to be able to smack that Black Panther out and interfere which means if the 16 moves to the left, it's over. If the Wong gets mo moved, one, two, three, I think that's it, y'all. I think that's it. I think Darth Tater may have actually pulled off four games in a row for the comeback. Cannonball, and he's second guessing himself. No, believe in the move. Believe in the move. Cannonball would be in there if it's Zola, it's over, and he goes for it. Does Rolk put it all on the line with an Arnim Zola? Two cards drop. Panther to the left, best possible placement. Gladiator's gonna come on down to an empty deck for eight with a Baron Zemo over the top. The 50-50 loses as Black Panther goes into the limbo lane as Darth Tater comes back four games in a row. What an opening round. What an opening round to this amazing top eight for the Snap Judgments League. Y'all stick around. Man, if this is how it's starting, buckle up. Welcome back. What a round one 
well, match one, excuse me, to uh, get us started here for the Elite Eight. We're going to hop into now match number two. So congratulations to Darth Tater, who's moving on to the semifinals, who we'll see in just a couple of minutes. So let's first go on to Looping Moon versus Thrillo, and Looping Moon will have another name today. It will be Absolute. That is their in-game name. So let's take a look. Get that up and running. GG's, good luck, have fun. Thrillo versus Looping Moon, AKA Absolute. What are they bringing to the party? And I'm already intrigued. I'm already intrigued because there's Doctor Strange and Elioth with a Deadpool. What is happening? Snow Guard on Thrillo's side <laughs> leans us to believe already potentially a Loki deck as Thrillo is able to take advantage of the Yabby with old school. Can we all have a moment of silence for old Zabu? Once again, these games are recorded from last week. I have not seen anything. We are getting ready for a new season for season two where we cast these games live. So let's enjoy and reminisce in old Zabu in its former glory as Ms. Marvel adds on five power into the Abbey and Carnage puts the Deadpool back into the hand. All right, Deadpool. One, two, Deadpool. Getting another two. And then the Doctor Strange over in the left also. Not sure what they were aiming for with the Strange on this turn, but that's a huge mechanic change and very cheeky simultaneously. I mean, a turn four Loki has got a, has got some bad things coming with it. For no snap, might as well try to get maybe another piece of information out of their deck, as they're now sitting on seven cards. Yeah, and old Eliath too, as being pointed out in the chat, 6-2 Eliath. May ye never return to ye's formal glory. <laughs> but the build nevertheless for this Phoenix Force deck is, is very intriguing as Forge into Hulkbuster drops in. Because Deadpool Carnage, Doctor Strange is a hell of a combo to build a second line for Phoenix Force. So you either destroy the Deadpool line and mess with the movements there, or you go down the path of I'm assuming this would be a Phoenix Force, like, multiple man style of build. But Taskmaster makes me think possibly otherwise. Because on the one end, if they play the destroy line, and again, this is Eliath in its former glory. If they play the destroy line, Loki early works great. But if it's the Phoenix Force line, it doesn't work great. So I think that matchup into Loki has to switch specifically how Absolute chooses to play the entire deck, yet alone watching what thrill, when Thrillo Loki's or doesn't. Solo Hulkbuster. As we get a snap. Huh. Draw two. 
and look to maybe possibly revive it and add on later. I like this call here of bringing over the Nico. Even though she's getting the bonus, Mojo World's going to be an annoying location to have to deal with. Hmm. Loki on four again. Does the full flip. Mojo's going to take the advantage now for Looping Moon. And now that Phoenix Force has got to feel really good into this lane. The only destroyed card this turn has been Hulkbuster. So that's not only going to attach, it's like an Inception attach where three things will happen. Phoenix Force will get the plus two power from Forge. Then add on Hulkbuster, then attach to something, and that something will be floatable. There's your two. There's your Hulkbuster, who's gone invisible rogue because there's so much happening. The blueprint then gets the buff and then attaches to Nico. Now giving us a floatable 112? Yeah, 112. As Cable now gets dragged over, locking the Mojo world only with 15 power. Hmm. And I like this call. I like this move. Take the Nico, who should be tallest, double it up in the throne room, and then Taskmaster it. Thrillo's Loki twice now has a pretty good idea of, if not all, the entire deck, possibly all of the deck from Looping Moon, knows that there's a Taskmaster at hand, and it's not worth trying to stick around for that. Good evade, run away, two cubes knocked, and one cube knocked. Not bad. Not bad. Lemuria. Hmm. Deadpool's safe here, but you do have multiple man in hand, too. And they... They opt to not give the plus two power to Deadpool. Instead, looking for just another movement. Now you could throw off the curve, use the ghost spider to drag it into the center, and hope for a carnage to destroy everything in the mid and have a good two out of three coming. Hmm. The multitude of lines that this deck is running is very tough. Because not only are you looking at your opening hand as defining your first three turns, but each variation of your first three turns redefines your turn five probably more than any other turn. Beautifully made deck as Juggernaut's gonna snack out, put a multiple man onto the left, and Nico's gonna add plus two to something. Now, you could play it safe. You could go for the 50-50 risk on the carnage and then go spider it into Kunlun. Keep the cheaper carnage on it. And hold the movement. Nope, they're gonna lock it out. Lock out the movement. There's your Ms. Marvel. So if Phoenix Force gets drawn, now you're looking at a 50-50, but 
it would be an automatic replication of a card if it comes back as Nico, which would come back as another floating Nico into the hand. And Big Venom, gonna be adding another eight onto 13, so that's gonna be a 21 power Venom that Taskmaster could even get cheeky and go over to the left with. Where it's a split difference right now. There they go, they drop wide, which gives the Cable Atlantis buff that goes up to 10. Here comes a Snow Guard Bear, who's gonna lock with Lemuria. So they won't flip. But I don't think that should end up affecting this play, this next play very much. If they go into the Taskmaster. They're doing the math. gonna be 21 so they're competing for 10 in Lemuria as the devil dino comes down for 20 versus 21 in the mid oh just barely by one looping moon's gonna hold on to the mid for two cubes and take it away from Thrillo who's now down four making this a nine to six going into round number three. Very tight in the middle lane and a lot of indiscretion, but no Loki meant they had to have some other kind of secondary play, whether it be, we see this very often now with Mockingbird, for example, Devil Dinos, always consistently a good option just for tall power. Almost, almost. Now the White Palace has already gifted over a Devil Dino, which could make for some fun cheeky plays. But restricts both players from taking advantage of it now in the middle lane. Thanks to Isle of Silence. Snow Guard would not be disabling it for the end of the game, unless if we ended up having a limbo in the right or get a conversion over in the White Palace. It's an altar of death. Now with this Phoenix Force deck, this is incredibly scary. The problem is they have none of the cards they typically would want to go into this. Forge into Nico into altar of death is what they're looking at here, who would go to a one four. If they bring it back, it would end up being a one nine that would be able to float. And there's your Loki on three for Zabu. As Nico's now with the double up piece on this. Man, that's gonna make for some big revival numbers and you have a Taskmaster in hand. Reviving with the Phoenix Force and then Taskmaster it, maybe with a Ghost Spider to swing it into Altar of Death. This is a big, tall conversion when, when it fully plays out. Deadpool's gonna benefit. Take it up, bring it back. And now we get a slide movement as they pick up their uh, multiple man, who's going to then now bring it to five in the altar of death. Nico sitting at four, destroyed in the altar of death, who's now going to double up upon revival via Phoenix Force.
Venom for just a little extra power. Watch that Phoenix Force, y'all. Interesting they're loading just a bunch of this power and not utilizing the Ghost Spider here. They're going for five power in the mid just to have five power and then Phoenix Force can move as it needs. Taskmaster could then go in the left, could go into the mid. Phoenix Force can slide, of course, all across the entire board. Because that's going to be a 118, I think, when all is said and done, as Deadpool also disappears again, now as a 4. There's a Rogue, just for some power. Doctor Strange, just for some power. Ghost Spider, just for some power. Here goes the Phoenix Force, reviving that Nico Minoru, who goes from 4 to 8 to 13. Sorry, 18, I was right. I was right the first time. Second-guessed myself. Now, we've got a snap. This is for Thrillo's everything here. As Thrillo drops the fist bump. And Looping Moon decides. As they sit now. Is it worth it to do the double? Or is it worth it to try to snipe? Because remember, this is also old Eliath. This is a full destruction 6-2 Eliath. So where do you put Nico? You have priority. You're going to steal at least that much. Four cards drop on Thrillo's side. Here comes the Taskmaster for 18. Ms. Marvel's part one. Deadpool part two. Taskmaster part three. And a Ghost Spider as part four. It's not enough to steal the Altar of Death. And Looping Moon knocks out Thrillo for six cubes with the Mega Taskmaster play. We thought it here in the chat too. No Shang-Chi dropping on the final turn. Risky, risky final snap. But that does mean that Looping Moon is moving on to the semi-finals. But who is Looping Moon going to be facing? Well, stick around. You'll find out. <laughs> All right, welcome back. Welcome back as we move on to our third match here for the Elite Eight. It is Santi Dubos versus Slush Death. Let's see what they're bringing to the table in this matchup. Match Good luck. Have fun. It is Slush Death versus Dubos. As the game glitches, and loads on up. But we're gonna call him the boss. Cause that's just way more fun, let's be honest here. Way more fun. Call Obsidian Cosmo Nico Sentry. Cryo pushing junk. Okay. I see you, Slush. I see you. And a kitty pride. And Castle Zemo, everybody's favorite location, makes its first appearance. So far, at least in these Elite Eight rounds. Korg for the destruction also. Get the guaranteed card draw from the Abbey. Annie ends up into the hand. You get a rock, you destroy, you draw two. Ooh, so Cull Obsidian armor, we could be looking at a Tuma. This is fully capitalizing on old Zabu. Oh yeah. As we see a Quinjet now make an appearance. Hmm. Okay. 
Okay. Cable comes down, takes a card draw away. When Jack gonna be able to reduce it on down, Snow Guard comes in, gives two cards to to the boss, but puts the Snow Guard on their side of the battlefield. Hood in hand with a one drop already on this side too is feeling pretty solid to be able to send over the hood and we get a snap from DeBoss. Already in round one. Looking at the play lines, you're getting down to 10 costs. That means that Scar is going to drop down to 411. Loki, Zemo, Quinjet, man, all of those fours just became twos in DeBoss's hand as they sit with a 14 Darkhawk also to play with. I like this line in particular. If they go down that path again, don't send over. Don't, don't give them a Darkhawk. Don't give them the Darkhawk. Come on, you know better. I like the Valley of the Hand play also, because remember, Valley of the Hand's gonna bring back the destroyed Korg from the very from the second round, excuse me, the second uh, turn. So it will beef up that Darkhawk again, meaning it'll cap out at 14. Potentially. Not needing to Annie over the hood. It always feels good. But they sentry now with their own rock slide that's been copied over from Loki. Here comes a Korg also, plus a Jeff just to say that you're having fun. Darkhawk drops in, goes to 14, adds on the Korg back to that side via Valley of the Hand, shoots up to 16 just for the moment as the card draw comes with one of those inked rocks. And Jeff can move, so just firing over to Hood to say you did. And adding another 11 to the left under the guided safety and the on reveal. Okay, you know what? This actually looks pretty solid for Slush right now. Slush has the ability to also interfere with, the, with a potential rogue if there's a top decked rogue out of the Loki deck. because armor would be there, then making it a 50-50. Oh. How does DeBoss come back here? Specifically with the Abbey being down three. They have to load pretty heavy in the left, right? Let's find out. Scar flips over first, giving 26 as the number to beat as the hood goes over through the Castle Zemo gates and leaves two power only into the mid, which will be most likely gone over via the Jeff and the extra mechanic. Here comes the Annihilus, who doesn't activate behind the Cosmo. That's going to give 27 given the combo of Mockingbird being pretty much free at that point too. So Annihilus, Mockingbird, armor, that's enough to seal the left in the mid. That's gonna take a four cubes to start us off here. Never feels good losing four cubes in round number one. Let's move to round two and see if Slush Death has enough to come back over the top now that they have an understanding of their Loki deck. Weir Island's a tough location with the hood in particular because it's almost an immediate forecast that I plan on sending this over no matter what. So a tough move for Slush here. As Zemo appears for the second time in a row in the middle location, but don't worry, location patching isn't real. As Snowguard comes back over again, likes hanging out on our side of the fence. Hmm. And Sokovia tosses a bloodstone and a sentry. Sentry kind of hurts. Hmm. 
The removal of the power-up from Weir Island is interesting. As nowhere allows no cards to enter the boss's hand. Nice flip from Scarlet Witch to benefit Slush Death here as they're going to top on over with nothing that can be Shang-Chi'd. That call just is big ol' power into nowhere as Cable's going to steal another card. Quinjet's added as the ongoing, non-interfering with nowhere. And now... Debating, do you look at the Annihilus line to fire over in the mid? Or do you go with Darkhawk to cheapen down the Scar? And I think that's probably the better line just because you end up with a 211 Scar, a 23 Armor, and a 510 when all is said and done, Darkhawk. Which still could even go up if we end up seeing another Korg or a Rock Slide get drawn simultaneously. Mockingbird, Mockingbird into Zemo is a very weak draw. Uh, very weak turn five. I like the snap here. This, I'm thinking the exact same thing. They're reading my mind. Slush death. Very nice snap here. DeBoss knows better and decides to run away. All right. Go to round three. Hub gives out a carnage. Nothing too crazy here. But Quinjet on one with the hub is definitely got to feel good if you're the boss. Lemuria. Looking to get flipped. Please hold, we'll revisit you in a moment. As we now go to Sacred Timeline. Neither player really truly gonna benefit from it unless they can fill by turn four. So if DeBoss gets the Loki deck build that they want, Sacred Timeline could be that big final play. Two more cards enter the hand after Cable does a draw. Scarlet Witch flips over the Lemuria into Valley of the Hand puts another Scarlet Witch over into their own hand and may have to consider flipping over Sacred Timeline if they're worried about a Mega Loki. Again, we see a Cull Obsidian safely under the guise of armor in the left. And there's your Loki on four. Flip it on over. Big cards, big, big flip overs. Plus Quinjet already down. That's going to be a heavy rain of cards if we end up getting a top deck marking bird to boot. Could be dangerous. And Scar Korg looks at the line. No cards have been destroyed, so we're not looking at a valley return. Although it is tempting with that carnage. And DeBoss snaps and Slush wants nothing to do with it. Puts on the retreat later. Going to take away only one. That's going to drop him down to five. It's nine to five. The boss is Loki deck. Versus Darkhawk. Clog. Ish. Reinforced. From Slush. All right. Beefy card, beefy card, beefy card. It's how we start on off here for Slush. With a Tarnax 4, which we do like. We do like the randomness of Tarnax 4 here. But I don't know if Slush is really too happy about it. Now with a hood, 
dropping in. Which will get a flip as Cable first pulls a card over to DeBoss's side and turns into a hazmat, which does absolutely nothing. The Hood's gonna get an upgrade either way, flipping in Tarnax from the Hood into Nova. So, four power swing. Better than the negative three right now. We see a rock slide demon for mana play to start. The rock slide also into Tarnax feels pretty solid, given that it's only a 3 3 stat line. And Elsa Bloodstone in Tarnax doesn't have the feel you want for the next two turns. You may want to hold off filling that lane before the movement or mitigate it. Okay. Spread the resources right now. There's your Loki into Tarnax on four, who's going to convert into Phoenix Force. So eye for an eye, essentially. Five cards are in their hand, and we get a peek! Who beefs up that Dark Hawk even further now down to his old former glory of four cost. That Dark Hawk definitely feels good. The question is, is it enough? This puts them at a win in the center. They're currently leading on the right. This is a plus. It's not a lot of power. I'm going all in on the right. Because you see the Elsa Bloodstone, it looks like that's going to be a favorable play. But they're going to want Eward to play into that line. But they did Loki. No Quinjet down this time. But they still did Loki. Two, three rock slides, nothing to sneeze at. Hmm. All right, they go with the Cosmo for the tech over the power of Scar, because Scar would go up to a 4 8 with the Elsa Bloodstone bonus on the left hand side. But for the sacrifice of that three power, stopping the on reveals in the Tinkerer's Workshop seems to be the stronger play in their mind. Now, they could have Loki all over also a Darkhawk, which would be sitting in Dubas's hand. As remember, they have already played a Rock Slide, but Dubas backs out. Nothing's gonna go over the top. They're insecure about winning those two lanes and decide to take a step back. All right, we're moving to high stakes then as an eight to, with an eight to five lead in favor of DeBoss. Hmm. All right. Pop in the gins. And man, that bar with no name is really, really kicking slush at the moment. But a Nihilus gin could be the winning move.
with Slush also having a Scarlet Witch in hand, this looks like probably should have been a snap scenario. Just for the threat alone of Scarlet Witch. Ooh, we've got Toss Bait. As Mockingbird, already able to come on out with the Nor Dimension via the Jins. And Cable gets the pull too. Hand is already full, so nothing happens. Jin's gonna add two power, disappear into the deck, pop out the Darkhawk for some big beefiness. Quantum tun Tunnel feels a whole lot better now as Rock Slide also brings up that Darkhawk to 20, disappears into the deck, brings out the Nico Minoru, who's got the plus spell. So, now with six on there, You aim to hope to clear and clog simultaneously. They do have their Jeff that they can move out at any point if they need to. But the Quantum Tunnel very heavily favoring Slush there as Annie's able to successfully land the hood into the newer dimension, which will interfere with the final play. Only one card now can be dropped on this final turn as Jeff has the option to move to the left, but I don't know how they're gonna be able to go over the top here. There's the snap, very well appropriately earned snap. Take your two cubes, move on. Seven to five, advantage, sorry, six to five. Six to five, advantage to boss. Lehigh gifting out a Juggernaut here. Juggernaut, one of the best surprise plays and most underrated surprise plays in Marvel Snap, in my opinion. Could make this a very interesting turn six if Slush gets the positioning right going into the final turn. An Avengers Compound. We could see that Juggernaut come to be on turn five. That Juggernaut in Avengers Compound to clog up either Monster Island or Camp Lehigh would be a very solid play. They are sitting on the Demon, they are sitting on the Darkhawk, so that is already a pre-built turn six if they need it to be. So we could look at a Scarlet Witch RNG piece with Juggernaut and Scarlet Witch even on turn five. And with the monster already on the board, Scar's gonna get drawn on turn four as a four cost card. And Slush is gonna protect his monster. They opt to eat energy just to be able to play down the witch and open up the adventurer's compound for turn five. Rock goes into the compound as that flips to the Gamma Lab, who's going to do nothing on turn four. And still no draw of the Annie.
There we go. Darkhawk comes on down, lowering the scar down even further as Angela makes an appearance with crossbones. Hmm. And look, there's that juggernaut. Gonna keep that lane clear, drop 14 power into Monster Island. This is a really solid move here by Slush. Camp Lehigh getting its value. Ooh. What does DeBoss have? Apparently, nothing. And with that, DeBoss backs down and now ends up in the deficit. It is now five to four, heading to round seven. Slush has had some great, great combinations to work with. Very, very solid deck. So let's see what Quinjet Loki on this turn is going to be a feel for them. Hell's Kitchen helps out both players here. As Nico ends up with the destroy spell. Into the hood. There you go, Nico. go ahead and take that hood. Here's a demon, destroy the hood, draw two more cards. They're gonna have a full hand. They have their full capability to work with. And a throne room to boot. Coulson's looking to pull anything substantial for the throne room as both players ignore murder world entirely let me give a couple of rocks via my molten rock slide leaving that dark hawk right now with a ceiling of 16 excuse me 14 when all is said and done here's a sentry which for 10 in the left would feel solid either way knowing that even if they do clog the throne room bright and early and he's just gonna go for the full destruction. And White Queen may have just drawn Annihilus because the scar was reduced down to four. So we could have competing Annie's or competing Darkhawks. But Darkhawk heavily favors Slush Death in this matchup here due to all the rocks already added into the deck. If White Queen just pulled Annie, this is a big move here. Yet that Darkhawk at 14 may be tall enough to even withstand without having to get rid of the void. White Queen was drawn via Agent Coulson, so they still have a five cost card. Even if that card was Red Skull, it would be feeding another plus two power to that Darkhawk, which would resolve at 516. They go with Scar in the mid for DeBoss. And there's the Darkhawk. Now you've got a 211. We haven't seen any super scary threat 
but this could be it for DeBoss versus Slush Death. He's going in for four cubes. He says, I have it. The question is, does he? It's all about the throne room. As we're about to see 22 dropped into Murder World. And we still have to deal with the Void. Slush having Pryo here is a little scary. Colson could not have pulled Shang as Colson did pull the White Queen as its four cost option. What's going to pop into the throw room? DeBoss, you're up against the ropes, man. It's all about the throne room. You've got to take over 30 because it's going to be 22 as the number to beat in the left. They put two cards down. They got a Shang-Chi draw finally. Takes out the one and Mockingbird brings it to a tie. It's not enough. Thanks to the yeet of Annihilus, the strongest package currently in Marvel Snap. Sentry Annihilus for the one-two punch. And Slush Death takes down the boss. So, with that said, that does mean officially that Slush Death is moving on to your semifinals. Now, with that also said, we do have a fourth match for the semis. Now, unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances, that fourth match had complications in its recording. So we get the honor of saying that in the matchup between Goat Seeker and Lofiason, Goat Seeker did move on into the semifinals. So your semifinals are Darth Tater versus Goat Seeker and Looping Moon versus Slush Death. So stick around as we head to the top four, your semifinals, in just a moment. And if this is a low... Welcome to the semifinals here for season one at the Snap Judgments League. We've had some amazing matches over the last several weeks, and now we're down to our final four. There are just three matches left so let's see which of these two will try to become number one here for season number one let's open us up with darth tater versus goat seeker for semi-final number one good luck have fun what are they bringing to the party and we're back to seeing darth tater's point of view again and it looks like it is potentially the same style that war machine blob big old deck to get us open and running but what is goat seeker bringing because we did not get to see goat seekers unfortunate uh match that brought them into the semi-final so this is just as a much just as much of a surprise to us as it is to darth tater with a human torch to start leaning pretty heavy already into I'm assuming a Phoenix Force deck and both players are going to be able to take advantage of their locations in a wide manner that Professor X may become the best card in Darth Tater's deck as we see a disappearing Human Torch. Hmm. So if you're Darth Tater with a Prof X acceleration deck, you absolutely need to be looking for your opening line, opening hand snap line of a turn two Ravona into a turn four Professor X. If you can pull that off regularly, Tater, you can hold off on this Phoenix Force because Phoenix Force right now is one of the strongest combo decks in Marvel Snap. If you're up in upper infinite, lower infinite, doesn't matter if you are or not in infinite. Right now, Phoenix Force, which is a very complicated deck, is a very strong deck 
in this competitive meta. As we see Pixie also come on down, but all the big cards are pretty much already in the hand here. There's no reason to drop that. So we're looking at War Machine maybe, maybe go for the Risky X, and they're gonna go for the ris Risky X. Trying to lock into Fisk Tower as we get a snap. And Goat backs away. Simple cube, take it. Nice easy lead for Darth Tater, 10 to nine, going into round number two. Hmm. Lintar is interesting here, especially with Ebony Maw in hand. It could become a turn three play. Nice starting Nebula in the left. And Pixie getting an introduction. You know there's at least a Sunspot still in the deck from the last match that we saw of Darth Tater, so that one could flip into maybe that She-Hulk. Or Cannonball. Or the Profex! Or the Profex. This could be an easy lane win right here. And we get a snap to come down. The unpredictability allows Goat Seeker to say, I'm not even gonna try to figure it out. Take your turn, have your fun. Let's try this again. Go into round number three. 10 to eight, favor of Tater. Again, all the big draws, drawing both Infinite and Blob simultaneously in the opening hand never feels good if you're Tater. You're looking for just one or the other. Because Blob is a dead draw almost if you have Infinite in hand. And if you don't have Infinite in hand, you want the Blob for that big extra over the topness. And look, we have another snap. A Death's Domain for the Phoenix Force deck has got to feel pretty good. A little risky just because Dark Dimension's in the left. If we end up with a location like Nowhere, for example, in the right, it could be detrimental for Ghost Seeker's plan. And it's Starlit Citadel. Now it's going to get really interesting. The Starlit Citadel in particular, with the timing of the on reveals based on Dark Dimension's movement, could be incredibly fun. That's something Tater's got to keep an eye on here. Possibly playing down that War Machine underneath the Dark Dimension is the play. Then see where Death's Domain goes to rock. Hmm. They go for the War Machine into the right as Phoenix Force is able to revive in time and start scaling that Human Torch as fast as possible. With it being turn four, we see at least two movements coming down the pipeline, and War Machine keeps open all locations. The Ebony Maw, being that Starlet Citadel moved at the end of turn four, means that Ebony stays under until turn six. So we could be looking at a Professor X into the Death's Domain, maybe with a Cannonball afterwards. Looks like to be the safest line, especially if Human Torch moves because most likely he's gonna end up in a priority situation. There you go, they steal the Dark Dimension as Human Torch moves to the mid and doubles up to 14 power. Ghost Spider's gonna slide that over and bring that to 28 power. So now with 30 on the board and a locked off left lane, even if it, let's say it was a tribunal deck, if it was tribunal, that would be nine power. That'd be 39, which would be 13 in all avenues. Sunspot would go up only one to 11. So that's really the only concern at this moment for this cannonball. Most other cards, Darth Tater's gonna win this flip because Goat Seeker reveals first.
tribunal wins it for Goat Seeker. Any, almost anything else. And remember, at the time of this recording, Old Eliath was also still in existence. So we could even still see Old Eliath, which I have seen in a couple of Phoenix Force builds. So, tough call here, but this is definitely for four cubes. This is a good one to move in on, even if you're Darth Tater, unknowing the entire deck. Human Torch goes over. Here comes the Shuri to double up a Carnage, just giving a bare amount to go over and beat the Ebony Maw, but little do they know, even with a 56 power, soon to be 112er, Cannonball clears the lane and gives the Dark Dimension back to Darth Tater, taking off four cubes from Goat Seeker. It is 10-4, can you hear me? 10-4, favor of Darth Tater. Castle Blackstone. Neither player going hard on it. Stark Tower. Again, neither player going too crazy on it. The magic in hand with She-Hulk Infinite simultaneously has got to feel good. Hater looking at some very favorable lines to work with. As Nico into Ghost Spider gives the advantage of Castle Blackstone over to Goat Seeker because Ghost Spider adds on its plus two. And one of the most frustrating locations in Marvel Snap, New York appears and if you're Darth Tater, do you get rid of the Castle Blackstone for the constant disadvantage, the uncertainty of New York, or just the extra random power from Stark Tower? Personally, I would go for New York, but Darth Tater has opted to turn location number one, Castle Blackstone, into Limbo. Turn four now a full float with no mana benefit. and a doubled up Phoenix Force for straight stats comes down into Stark Tower under no revival situation. You have a two cost She-Hulk and a two cost Cannonball at the moment. Tough to decide what to move and what not to move on this turn. But instead of getting the plus two in Stark Tower and moving it, She-Hulk lands into Limbo exclusively. And a solo Nimrod in New York, in my opinion, screams Phoenix Force moving to New York, followed by Zola. That's what I personally would read. What about you here in the live chat here on Twitch? What do you read on this turn? Because remember, you do have a 2-8 Cannonball, a 4-0 Blob. There's an argument to be made that only Ravona gets played on this turn. And here we go. Everything moves over into New York, including the Shuri as Venom eats it all up, putting the Nimrod into Limbo, Nimrod into Stark Tower, big old giant Venom with a Deathlock on top to fill Limbo on the left. Deathlock stays there, but watch out. Here comes the Blob to go over the top. As a 14 power draw, Cannonball knocks out a Nimrod over into the Venom lane. And now you're sitting on exclusively 
a 5-7, oh, sorry, a 5-2 Sunspot. Translation to 5-3 Ravona. This is a retreat later. Lots of surprising moves here. Looks like it wasn't getting any kind of plan for a Zola at any point, but they were semi setting up for it with that Venom at the same time, but the Deathlock surprised me. So big plays there, big plays. Goat Seeker takes off Darth Tater's first removed cube, now making it nine to four. Academy, probably. See, this favors both players because on the one end, Strange Academy clearing out favors the Cannonball line. On another end, Strange Academy benefits Human Torch and Phoenix Force movements pretty expansively. One one pixie in the danger room. I like it. Even though all your bigs are in hand, you're only pixie mixing just a couple of cards. Goodbye, pixie. You've been squashed by the danger room. X Mansion. Let's see what the RNG presents. It's a Celine to reduce down the blob by negative three and a Doc Ock. Doc Ock and X Mansion. Oh, this could be big. Here goes the Nimrod into Deathlock, doubling those Nimrods already. Only one card left in Goat Seeker's hand as the next reveal is Shuri at four, negative two. Ooh, man. Not necessarily the best of your Doc Ock pulls that you could have seen. Ooh, man, that's a tight one. Four ten She Hulk's gonna drop down as Enchantress gets doubled by Shuri to four ten. So now we've seen the Enchantress reveal for Tech. And Goat Seeker here has not used their Venom yet. A little bit of that movement banking could restrict them from play, wanting to play in Strange Academy either way. They opt to not as Phoenix Force goes down, revives, turns into another Nimrod, who goes up to 23 as Nebula and Profex lock that location. Nobody moves. And the location's gonna get stuck at 23 v 7. That's a lost lane for Darth Tater, and with all, with all three favoring Goat right now, it's, yeah. Unfortunately, it's gonna be a retreat later scenario for Darth Tater, losing two cubes and bringing us at seven to four as Goat Seeker wins two in a row, going into round number six. This is a very difficult matchup for Goat Seeker. Playing, trying to play around this Professor X and is navigating it very effectively. The Doc Ock was definitely the downfall, unfortunately, for Darth Tater there. It wasn't even his own deck. It's the magic of X Mansion. Bonus energy gives a turn one pixie to Darth Tater with only Blob and Cannonball as the big cards in their hand. We get a snap to bring it into four cubes and try to push Goat Seeker in on this turn. Now that we're in the high stakes, Goat Seeker's gotta have the opening hand to try to come back and says, I can't do it right now. I'm gonna try to do four in a row, which we've already seen happen in today's broadcast. So good luck, Goat Seeker, trying to take down 
the Pixie matchup from Darth Tater. Oh, man. They open the hand with no sixes, but they do draw their Pixie. Pixie, Ravona, Ebony. Could be a very strong stack. And nothing happens for Goat Seeker already in the combos. First two turns, nothing being dropped from Goat Seeker that doesn't feel good. But we do end up in a very locked scenario. Here comes the Pixie. War Machine is now officially in hand. So Ebony Maw is a lot less scary than it was before as Human Torch Ghost Spider drops as the combo on turn three, flipping the advantage of Mojo World to a tie. My apologies, I thought it was up. And now Tater's got to decide, can I lock this down for the win? I have the priority. Is my little one power Profex gonna be enough to do it? Typically, we look at a destruction or a movement of a, mo of a human torch here when they're stacked together. And that's exactly what Darth Tater thought too. Locks in the human torch and ghost spider taking the big lead in Mojo World thanks to that plus 100 power. And now with a war machine cannonball in their hand as a combo, this has got to feel like a great scenario for Darth Tater when trying to knock out Goat Seeker. Priority is in the favor of Darth Tater no matter what this doubles up. and Cannonball becomes a little bit less of an option. Given the priority, you could try to knock out the Nimrod and live on 14, and that's what they go to do. They take that Nimrod, move it into Lemuria, giving them a 14 on the lead. The Deathlock does not destroy Nimrod. It is 14 to five in the left as they add on with Venom. The Venom moves that Nimrod back over and he swings two cubes. The goat is not dead. It is not time for Curry, ladies and gentlemen. It is time for round number eight. Going in five to two, Darth Tater versus Goat Seeker. Oh, <laughs> in a weird world. And a weird world comes in. Oh boy. All right. Sunspot Nebula. And Mojo. Multiple man Shuri Ebony. Ghost Spider moves over the Sunspot into Mojo World to try to compete for the 100 power. Darth Tater's in desperate need of his icon. He's looking for that Shuri Nimrod combo and he draws it. He draws Shuri Nimrod. We start seeing some draws. We could see lots of Nimrods hit the board for Tater. Oh, and he draws the Venom. And he draws the Venom. And he goes to Shuri on the left rather than Mojo World. A little bit of a shock play. Hoping for that double destroy. He pulls the double destroy out of Weird World. 
No way. Talk about the ultimate top deck combo draw weird world name. I don't even know what to call it, but he pulled the nuts. Here comes all of the Shuri Nimrods and friends. Which spells on Nico? Becomes a demon. This would be worth dropping. So don't lose out on that before the carnage. Here comes all the Nimrods. Nimrod doubling number one. Here's a 12 for you and a 12 for you. Venom eats it all up, goes to 16. Carnage drops in the mid, destroys you. Here's a Nimrod for you and a Nimrod for you. Here's a big old Nico Minoru as Infinaut is a big boy, but not the biggest of boys. And with that, Darth Tater moves on to the Snap Judgment League Season 1 Finals. But who? will they face for the official season one crown? Will it be Looping Moon or will it be Slush Death? Stick around, we'll be right back. Welcome back, welcome back to the semi-finals here. We are in the second match of our semi-finals trying to figure out who is going to be going up against Darth Tater. Will it be Looping Moon? Will it be Slush Death? Let's find out. Let's swing on over, get the match started. Remember, Looping Moon is also known as Absolute, and Slush Death is, well, Slush Death. Let's see what happens. Good luck, have fun. There's a Prof X, a Jeff, and a Nebula, and a Daredevil, so we got a little bit of a deck switch up here coming out of Looping Moon. Let's see if Slush brings back the same deck from their quarterfinal match as Monster Island gifts everybody a monster. There's a Prof X, there's a Rulk making an appearance. Nice Prof X targeting ability as Rulk starts its ramp, but it's only a TVA! It's a TVA match! As Jeff drops with some flexibility, and a Red Guardian, the newest card currently in Marvel Snap at the time of this recording, uh, as by about an hour and a half. As Korg lands in Asteroid M and Scarlet Witch gets rid of the TVA. So it looks to be a similar line for Korg, Scarlet Witch, Darkhawk line that we saw from Slush Death earlier. But now, hmm. Now we have to try to figure out, are they gonna be able to lock down either of these lanes in time with that Prof X? As Call of Sidian lands, that Green Goblin feels like it did almost nothing in the left. And at least Looping Moon does have a lockable location potential play with the Prof X. They could also clog, but remember Slush Death, who has to deal with Asteroid M, may have to be able to play around it, and it's their Darkhawk. They're playing their Darkhawk down. It's a little bit of a risky move. I'd be looking at that Hobgoblin personally, and yeah, I like the Hobgoblin here. Clog up Asteroid M entirely then be looking at that big old Rulk. I like this, I like this play a lot more now. Plus you've got the Jeff that you can move. If you Prof X on the right, then you do officially pin your Jeff. Here comes a Darkhawk. And here comes a Goblin. Send the Goblin over into Asteroid M, giving the advantage officially to Absolute there. No cannonball has been drawn. And Red Guardian would not hit Darkhawk. It would still hit the monster given the ongoing ability. 
So now it's a decision of, do you think Rulk would be a good play all by itself? Or do you try to go over the top and go for the surprise in Monster Island? And we see an eight cube snap back. It's round one. And Slush thinks he has it. Could we have a round one eight cuber in the semifinals? Slush has priority to flip. Rulk is not going to need to be worried about from a chi perspective. Each player barely knows the other player's deck. You're running out of time. Looping Moon, are you doing it? He commits. It's an eight cuber. Four. Scar comes down. Hood comes down. That was a free scar because Annie's gonna fire over the hood, the goblin, and the goblin, so that Rolk does nothing. That's a casserole for the slush death. As Monster Island makes the free scar plausible, never saw the Annie coming. And Absolute now has an absolute incredibly difficult climb to come back and take down Slush Death. It's 10 to two in round number two. Oh, that hurts. As we have another TVA game appearing. Man. Here's a hood to prop out a demon. Ooh, Red Guardian to reduce the Korg and then slide over into Asteroid M. I like the combo here, because then you do also still have your Jeff and your Daredevil. As here goes the Red Guardian, takes down that Korg by two, shimmies over via Asteroid M, flips over the first card of the Demon into Asteroid M, followed by Scarlet Witch again to get rid of the TVA, who's converted into Mojo World. Daredevil Jeff or Rescue. Now, don't forget, Rescue, though played into Mojo World, will slide into Asteroid M, and as long as you don't play into the Mojo world, sorry, you do play into the Mojo world. I'm confusing it with Jessica Jones. <laughs> Jessica Jones play versus rescue play. One wants it, one doesn't. Rescue, you now are committed to playing into Mojo world 100%. The question is though, do you cannonball now or do you go with all of your littles instead to clog up Mojo world? Because you can drop the Jeff, you can drop the Daredevil, you can drop the Spider Ham. And that's exactly what they do. They're going to give Rescue her plus five, bring her to four nine via the targeting. Darkhawk lands into Mojo World to try to stack over the top there. Spider Ham's going to hit the Cosmo, revealing that out of Slush Death's hand for the first time. As now. Absolute, who's clinging on for dear life right now, can't take advantage of Green Goblin because of the fear that now exists from Annihilus. So it's Rulk or Cannonball. With Absolute flipping first, makes it a little bit of a harder play, but I think the power up and just hope for the best might end up being their best line. Looking at every possible combination. Do I risk it? Do I try to go for a cheeky win in one of the lanes? Do I isolate here? Do I just go all in? Because right now, 
that's only nine power. They could put, for example, the Red Hulk into Mojo World and try to leave the Jeff all by itself, but this is tough. Because that Jeff is just not enough power to take over any other lane. Here comes the Cannonball to take that Dark Hawk and hits it into the Jeff lane. Hits it into the Jeff lane. There's a Scar. There's a Nico. There's a Pig. And with that said, Slush Death in two rounds takes down Looping Moon, which means our final has been laid out here for the Snap Judgments League Season 1. Your final is Darth Tater versus Slush Death. Stick around as we present your finals right here. <sighs> Everybody, take a moment. Catch your breath. Welcome to the finals. Welcome in everyone. For those who do not know, my name is Guest, also known as It's Guest Gaming. It has been an honor this season to cast the Snap Judgments League inaugural season. And after weeks and weeks of climbing and battling and back and forths, we are here. We have made it to the grand final. We are here for season one. Get ready for season two. But guess what, y'all? We got one match to go. It is for the final Darth Tater versus Slush Death. Let's swing on over. Good luck. Have fun. Let's find out who's going to take down the inaugural crown for the Snap Judgments League. What are they bringing? Who knows? But we're we're going to watch this one from Slush Death's perspective today as they connect slowly eventually but surely there we go all right slush death bringing in the same deck the void strategies they have named their deck Just playing down the hood into the Castle Zemo lane one turn too early. But they're going to fire over the Nico instead. Nico, movement, pixie. A little bit of randomness, send that back. All right, so now Slush Death is gonna have to try to navigate this Pixie deck, which we've seen absolutely stun several opponents now, just today alone, yet alone now trying to mix it in with a Sinister London. Slush may have no choice but to get rid of that. As great as it would be to be able to put down that Cull Obsidian and basically free Scar when all is said and done. With the movement of New York, it's a double-edged sword. That's a lot of Cull Obsidians. That's great protection. Armor already into New York. Cull Obsidian also now moving already into New York. Double War Machine. With the movement on the final turn, we could see... I'm trying to remember if it's Culls or Crossbones that Darth Tater ran in their deck, but they're just gonna load up. Here's 10s and 11s and 10s and 11s. I'm gonna leave myself with only two spots on the board, but you know what? I can deal with it. Slush Death is feeling really good right now. Loading up some extra rocks, hoping for that double Darkhawk more than anything right now. As the War Machine floats. War Machine floats. 
So we are probably looking at the double infinaut. Double infinaut's not gonna take down all those Cull Obsidians and Scars. So he's gonna back away, give him the cube. Small advantage for Slush Death, but the, any advantage is an advantage here in the finals of the Snap Judgments League. Hmm. Abbey armor as a 1-2 starting point definitely feels good here. Nebula to try to compete. Looks like both players are going to have to draw then from it. Ooh, collapse mine. So now, what would you do? Would you steal the card, draw, skip three? Or would you play and, and skip on three or skip two and see what happens? And looky here as they sit on armor in their hand. This could be a stolen lane. Oh, this will be a really, really fun move. At the expense of getting a card draw, looks like Tater's gonna lose the collapsed mine as Slush Death could not wait any longer to get that armor into the middle lane. This is a snap condition if I ever saw one, Slush. Come on, buddy, you're thinking about it. Just do it, there it is. Take the cube. Take the two, hopefully. You know they've seen the armor. So either way, whether this is a bluff or not, this is a great snap on this turn. Tater believes the armor and backs away for a cube. Not worth finding out the hard way if you could guess this right. And with no potential movement plan, not worth it. Well done. Difficult, difficult retreat to make this early on, on such a, seems like a nominal play, but there's a reason that both of these players have made it all the way to the finals. It's this type of understanding and respect for snaps. Build your own Viper as location number one and Los Diablo space as number two. This could backfire that hood. Actually, no, Oscor will go off first, then Los Diablos will go off second based on the left to right ordering. So we should still see the hood fire over. As the Sokovia tosses the war machine, which feels pretty bad. And that Annie sitting as a dead card as long as they don't draw, as long as they haven't drawn their sentry. And the lockout Ebony Maw play with Oscourt Tower definitely doesn't feel good now. Cheeky, cheeky, cheeky. Looking at every possible build here. The protection of the Cull Obsidian under Los Diablos feels good. Put the Korg there and the Cosmo behind the ruins. I like the call here. Now they can drop their Cull Obsidian safely into the middle lane. Nebula's gonna ramp up another four. So they still have to climb to take over the Oscorp Tower, but they but they can climb uncontested. Here comes the blob into Los Diablos, who eats up only 13. Pixie, Rock, Rock, She-Hulk, Magic, Sunspot. So they're sitting on Infinite. They're sitting on Cannonball, and it's not enough because they could knock into the Oscorp Tower lane. They could try to knock, but they could knock out that Ebony Maw, but it's it's too risky. Too risky, especially with Scar on the board, knowing that Cull Obsidian's already down. 
It was a good play by Darth Tater to send over that Ebony Maw, but unfortunately, just not enough. Man, Hood is incredibly tempting to want to play into Jotunheim. Incredibly tempting to want to play into Jotunheim. But without a Nihilus, this is a little risky. Maybe we get lucky with a low Korg or Nico to also play into Jotunheim to really go all in on the Yeet synergy. But we don't see it drop. Instead, we have a Demon where you could steal the small lead since Baxter Building got its buff of plus fours to each other location. Pixie hits Baxter. Sokovia gets rid of magic, so Jotunheim ain't going anywhere. And now it's about all of the tall cards. And the Cosmo here is a little surprising. Yeah, I, I was about to say, the Cosmo in the center would restrict the Sentry from getting that Void out there. Maybe this is an illusion sell. This is selling the idea that I don't have Annihilus. Big play on this sentry to keep it out of Shang-Chi range with the Jotunheim play as She-Hulk Infinite because of Pixie drops down as a one-two punch on turn four. Could this be that instance where you forfeit Baxter and win everywhere else? Do we see that line come to be? Slush switches the op and goes for sending the Void and Hood over now rather than later. As Cannonball's gonna hit out the Sentry, Super loading that Sokovia side as Void and Demon fly over. 15's the lead in Sokovia, but there's still 11 to try to climb in Jotunheim or go over in the Baxter building. 11's only gonna get you to 20 in Baxter. It's not gonna be tall enough. But Scar into Jotunheim may do it after the Jotunheim reductions. because Scar would only drop to 10, that whole lane would drop to eight. But instead, Slush says, let me give you two. You took three. I still have a lead. Gonna move on eight to seven. Now. Let it be known at this time there is going to be a broadcast interruption. And the reason being is because these players were so determined to do this match right that even in the midst of having a technical difficulty, they went and did it the right way. So there will be an interruption in this broadcast after I believe the next round. When the next round completes, we'll switch screens for a second and get the second part loaded up because there was a disconnect from one of our players. So I want that to be known that we're not seeing two different games. These players want to do it the right way. They wanted to win properly and they didn't want to win by default on a disconnect. I won't tell you who or how, but just know that we are going to switch, switch screens after this round to showcase to you the second half due to the disconnect. But as of right now, let's continue on to see what happens first in this round. Pixie on two 
into Stark Tower's got to feel good. Nico trying to flip a location. He's going to have to wait a turn. Hmm. Cosmo flips the throne room into Valley of the Hand. No destruction mechanics, I believe, on either player's side here. As we review the deck lists, don't believe so. We should be a pretty safe location. I mean, Annihilus is in hand. Darkhawk going into Valley of the Hand would be a 512. If they drop the Annie now, that gives them a full tie in the mid. And Ebony Maw can't go over. We get a snap. And now a reversion due to snap thanks to the luxury of the undo button. We're looking potentially now at, in my opinion, the War Machine. And it's not! It's a Professor X! The Prof X makes its first appearance here today in slush in a slush deaths matchup with Darth Tater and steals the surprise. So now it's all about your left hand lane. Now it's all about the left hand lane. I was personally expecting to see War Machine to open up Stark Tower, but no. Darth Tater locks the Void in, and now Slush for seven cubes is deciding if this is worth locking for them or do they retreat. Scar Armor and Scarlet Witch is going to add on 17 power. It's going to bring the Valley of the Hand to 20. So with them officially locking in their line, we can tell you right here, this is where the hiccup is. This is gonna be the temporary broadcast hip hiccup. Take a look at your board right here. Darth Tater was retreating for four cubes at this moment. That makes the match eight, two, three. With the match going eight to three, we go to the second portion of the broadcast after these players first got rematched up and then brought their cube count back to the same cube count. The true sportsmanship between these two to make sure that they got a proper finals match and do it the right way goes to speak volumes about what this competitive scene is actually about. True, honest, fun, real competition, not technicalities. So let's join on in as now both players have re-battled back up to the same cube count that they were at just a moment ago. It is eight to three slush death versus Darth Tater. Wakandan Embassy has got to feel good for everybody in this situation, but especially for a deck that thrives on big cards. No cards are sitting at eight power, though, so it's not going to bring a faster acceleration to a scar necessarily. Korg armor, it's got to feel good. Two, three pixie also got to feel good. The question is, how does each player end up using bar sinister? Cosmo locks the Orcus Forge as an unrevealed dead location, and Nebula plays into Wakandan Embassy. Now Cull Obsidian stacks on the left a little further and higher, restricting the Nebula in, adding 10 that's going to bring it to 19 in Wakandan Embassy.
and it's 10 on 10. They both drop 10 drops. Still advantage into slush death. But with no other rock cards in their hand. Now it's a matter of is Bar Sinister an accelerator with Rock Slide? Because Tater has not shown a Shang-Chi yet. But Pixie's a dangerous card if we end up seeing a skip here on turn five. And Tater says, not it. Not ready, not gonna try it. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in a comeback situation once again. Darth Tater is down to their final cube while Slush sits with eight cubes. This is another four game comeback. We've seen it happen once. We've seen it not happen once. Will it happen? Ooh, Necrotia reducing down that Nico. Two negative locations back to back. Definitely doesn't feel good for the Void strategies. If either of those locations were in the right, it would feel fantastic. But the fact that they're left and center definitely doesn't. Here's another armor back to your hand. The dark dimension as the final play. <sighs> that Scarlet Witch has its work cut out for it. As magic does the work on it first, flipping the negative zone into limbo, reinforcing the armor and the rock slide simultaneously. Now with that extra seventh turn, some real shock damage could come to be on the battlefield for this location set. Sentry goes down, puts the void over into Dark Dimension, swinging the priority in that lane. Pryo still rests in the hand of Slush as Pixie is the third card already into Limbo. Oh, man, do you see what I see? Do you see the play that I see? Are we about to have a limbo cheat? Blob drops into Necrotia. Shoots up to 16, so that's actually 18 that it ate. And that's exactly what they're setting up for. They're going to set up for a limbo cheat out to try to win it. That's gonna be an 18 power difference in the Dark Dimension, but only a three power difference in Limbo. Sorry, six power difference in Limbo. Scarlet Witch adds on three, Cosmo adds on three. Korg adds on two. They go for the full skip. They didn't see the Scarlet Witch coming. Sunspot grows, but it doesn't matter. And just like that, Ladies and gentlemen, we have our season one Snap Judgments League champion, Slush Death. Congratulations, good game, my friend. Good game, congratulations. What an absolute showing with the Void Dimensions deck from Slush Death. What a wild cheat out. The luxury that you can get from Magic and Limbo quickly taken away by the Scarlet Witch. Swing the game just that fast. And with that, that, ladies and gentlemen, wraps up season one here on the Snap Judgments League. Before we go, let me make sure that I shout this out. Philip Ratko, Corey, Models, Pulse Glazer, 
And so it goes. Cables Numb, Gunny, Two T's, and the entire mod line who put this event together, they deserve tons of praise for season one going as smooth as it did. Thank you so much to topdeck.gg for collaborating with this team and creating a unique experience unlike any other tournament series we have had here yet in the Marvel Snap scene. From the content side, Mike, Savage Yeti, Zrob, the King of Canada, and Snap Variants, and myself, thank you so much for allowing us to be a part of the staff and broadcast and showcase these amazing, amazing events and battles. And once again, first golf clap to all of our participants. Every game that we've been able to showcase here to our top eight, to our semifinalists, to our silver placer in Darth Tater and Slush Death. Congratulations, you are the ultimate champion for season one for the Snap Judgments League. My name is Guest, also known as It's Guest Gaming. We hope you enjoyed season one. Get ready for season two. It's right around the corner. Thank you all so much. I hope you enjoyed today's broadcast. We will see you all next season. <laughs>